for what's happening, seeing everybody, seeing the new people. It's awesome to see. It always is. And I'm excited for God, for what he's going to be doing, taking us all forward. And uh, I guess a little bit on me, he mentioned a little bit, but uh, my uh, visa actually expires in September for the United Kingdom, so it kind of, I got to reapply for that, and plus the missionaries are on deputation, and they get back in January, so I'm kind of at a standstill, but I've been working here and there, odd jobs, but God's going to, he's always going to make a way, so amen. Amen, I want to thank God too. Well, it's always strange how God speaks to us, he speaks to us all in a little different way, and uh, how I got this message, I was... uh, I was struggling a bit, I'll be honest. I didn't know what I was going to preach on. And then on Thursday morning, I, uh, I got up, ate, whatever, went back into my room, opened up the door, I closed the door, and I smashed my head against the wall, and I'm like, God, what am I going to, God, what am I going to be preaching on? I, just, I bonked my head right on the wall. Just, and uh, he spoke to me, and he said, uh, Saul, the contradiction of Solomon. And I was like, all right, I'll see where this ends up. And... Uh, here we are, and it goes parallel with what Pastor Trail spoke about this morning, about neglecting your salvation. You guys might not know where I'm going, but if you know a little bit about Solomon, he was an interesting fella. He built the temple in Jerusalem. That's great. And that was in his fourth year of reign, using his wealth that his father, that him and his father also accumulated. And uh, he was great in wisdom. God gave him all that, but I'm going to get right into the sermon. Amen. If we could stand, we're going to turn our books in, in our Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 6 through 11. Amen. And Solomon said, Thou hast showed... Where are you, Tim? Where are you, Tim? 3, 3 6, 6 through 11? Yeah, oh, here we go. And Solomon said, Thou hast showed unto thy servant David, my father, great mercy, according as he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart with thee. And thou hast kept for him this great kindness. Thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father. And am I am now but a little child. I know not how to go out and, or to come in. And thy servant is in the midst of thy people, which thou hast chosen a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. Give therefore thy servant an understanding an understanding heart, to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad, for who is able to judge this thy so great a people. And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. And God said unto him, Because thou hast asked this thing, and hast not asked for thyself long life, neither hast asked riches for thyself, nor hast asked the life of thine enemies, but hast asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment. He asked for wisdom. Wisdom to lead the people, and that pleased God. Amen. Pastor Trey, if you pray over this service, please. Thank you, Jesus, Lord, for all you and what you're doing. Lord, we want to worship you, Jesus. We want to worship you. Lord, we want to even just preach this word. Lord, we want to watch this. Lord, we want to see your word being Amen. You may be seated. Amen. I'm going to start with the beginning of Solomon's life. Going back a couple scriptures, you would read that Solomon offered a thousand sacrifices. And I don't know about you guys, but the smell of the a thousand burnt sacrifices. So, so he burnt animals. He built. He burnt some things for the sacrifice. And it was a thousand. It wasn't a small number at all. I could just imagine him walking up that hill with all that. I don't even know how he carried it all. He must have had a big wagon or a couple oxes. He used the Ox Express. I don't know. But he brought them all the way up there on top of a mountaintop, and he burnt them to God. Amen. Has anybody ever smelt burnt flesh? It's not good. I, uh, when I was barbecuing one day, I turned on the propane, but I left the lid closed on the barbecue. I went back inside, I tried to light it, didn't light, so I closed the lid, the propane's still on. And uh, I went inside, grabbed some matches, put the matches in the bottom, opened it up, and I singed all, I singed my hair on my eyebrows, pretty much my eyelashes, everything else. Top of my hair, it stank, and it was nasty. 
So I'm just saying that smell of an animal would be terrible. Of that smell. But God, God, God liked it. He liked the burnt offering that was offered. And it was almost in this beginning in Solomon's life that we see him with his relationship with God. That we see it's almost like he's, um, he's similar to David in a way. How David Pant was always after God's own heart. And that when Solomon was done burning those thousand burnt offerings, God asked him a question. Ask what I shall give thee. Ask him what I will, what, what do you want from me? Ask and I'll give it to thee. Solomon could have asked for a multitude of things. Most of us would have asked for money. I mean, I like money. I, I do. It's nice to have, to buy things. Some people would have want power, that ambition, to always be ahead of someone else. A long life. People like to live long. Military might, etc., etc. He was a king. But he asked for something that was so different in a way. He asked for wisdom to lead the people. And God was pleased so much that he, he gave him more. If you continue reading in that scripture, in the, in the, in the first Kings there, chapter 3, you'd see that he gave him so much more wealth, fame. He gave them all. He gave it all to him. And we can even see this wisdom in action in 1 Kings 4, verses 20, 29 through 34. A very familiar portion there. And God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding exceeding much and largeness of heart, even as the sand that is on the seashore. And Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the children of the east country and all the wisdom of Egypt. For he was wiser than all men, than Ethan the Ezraite and Herman and Heman, sorry, and Chakal and Derda and sons of Mahol, and his fame was in all nations round about. And he spake 3,000 proverbs, and his songs were 1,005. And he spake of trees from the cedar tree that is in Lebanon, unto the hyssop, even unto the hyssop that springeth out of the well, out of the wall. He spake also of beasts and of fowl and of creeping things and of fishes. And there came all of the people to hear the wisdom of Solomon from all kings of the earth, which had heard of his wisdom. And we even know we even have in the book of Proverbs. He wrote the book of Proverbs. He wrote he's wrote some songs. He wrote the song of Solomon, and he wrote Ecclesiastes. And we see that his wisdom was, if you, has anybody ever read the book of Proverbs a little bit? It's, uh, it's, it's pretty wise, you know? Excuse me. But his wisdom, his knowledge knew no bound for his time. He was the smartest in his area. And people from around that part knew of it, of that world knew of it, and they came to see him just to hear his wisdom, just to hear his words. Wouldn't that be nice if somebody just came to hear you speak? It's nice. Some of us like the monologue at home. Wouldn't it be nice if you had an audience there? People would be like, oh, you're so right. And all this other thing, oh, that would puff you up a little bit. But he had some good wisdom on him. And uh, they, they also brought gold. They even paid for it. They brought gold. They brought tributes to him. They, got, they brought gifts, vessels, silver, gold, precious items to give to him just because they to hear his wisdom. As I said, that would be a nice gig. It would be a pretty sweet gig. He's like, he might be the first like psychology guy, you know, giving people like advice on their family matters and everything like that. And yeah, Tyson's falling in his footsteps. <laughs> and during this time, the kingdom of Israel it prospered. We saw, we read of their wealth, the temples being built. They have a ton of money. They're putting gold on pretty much everything inside the temple, gold, silver, all these precious metals. And you can read that in the first ten chapters of First Kings. If you'd like to know more of what was done and all the wealth, and I mean, we could be here forever. I could just read the whole book of First Kings, the first ten verses, and it would that'd be a long time. But I wish that I could say that that was the end for Solomon, that that was how he lived out his life. You know, wisdom, being, being great with God, you know, offering those sacrifices, living right. And being zealous and continuing after God's commandments. But if you know, when you read on Solomon's, he's kind of... When you reach chapter 11, that's when everything starts to change. And in 1 Kings chapter 11, verses 1 through 6. But King Solomon loved many strange women. Hmm. Together with the daughter of Pharaoh. He already married the daughter of Pharaoh back in the first chapter 3. And he loved women of the Moabites, Amor Ammonites, Edomites, Zidions, and Hittites. Of the nations concerning which the Lord said, now God said this, 
said unto the children of Israel, Ye shall not go into them, neither shall they come in unto you. For surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. And and Solomon clave unto these in love. But (laughs) here comes uh, verse 3. And he had 700 wives. 700. (laughs) And 300 concubines and his wives turned away his heart. Now man of wisdom. He was a man of wisdom, wasn't he? He had enough wisdom that he didn't listen to the commandments of God. God told him not to do it, but he did it. Not, not, the, strange, not the strange women just because they worshipped idols. They were foreign. They were not of Jewish descent. And plus, he was a king. And he was marrying, like, foreign people. Like, just, it, back in those times, it didn't really work out that well. And plus, as I said, God told him, because you're, you're going to ruin yourself spiritually. Because they're going to bring in their idols. But... I can say that most men today, I mean, you have one wife, you guys are wiser than Solomon right now. You guys are wiser, I can say that right now. Amen. As long as you don't have any concubines, you're okay. You're okay. Amen. In Proverbs chapter 5, and verse 3 to 5, that would come up. For the lips of a strange woman drop as a honeycomb. This is what I'm thinking. After he married all these ladies... These 700 strange women. I can see him writing this proverb being like, yeah, I shouldn't have done that. For the lips of a strange woman drop as a honeycomb, and her mouth is smoother than oil. But her end is bitter as wormwood and sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death, and her steps take hold on hell. But yeah, I don't know if that was his experience or not, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it was that he had a hard time serving God when he always had that when he always had his women beside him, being like, hey, let's worship our gods for today. You worship your god yesterday, let's worship mine. But one of the things about Solomon, he had wisdom, so much wisdom for like worldly things and for fleshly things, but he never took any of his spiritual wisdom to himself. He started out strong. Remember those thousands, those thousand sacrifices he started? He was very zealous for God. But then uh, these women, they came into his life, I shouldn't, but these idols that they brought with them. And it started to slowly chip away. I could think after the first one, because he married first off the princess of Egypt to make enmity with them, to make peace. And Egypt, they have a ton of gods. That's just, that was their their culture and everything back then. And then he started marrying the Amorites, Edites, Hittites, Shittites, everyone, all these ites. And he ever brought 700 of them. That would be a lot of idols. Not just their clothes and shoes, but idols. And it eventually turned him away. He started to compromise. After the first one, you know, there's a little bit, little bit of compromise here. More compromise, more compromise. And then, boom, all of a sudden you have 700 wives and 300 concubines. And they're all worshiping their idols. But God gave him another chance also in verses 8 and 9 of that same chapter. But you read that Solomon, he didn't change his ways. He became like a double-minded man. He was unstable in his ways, in his mind a little bit. He was trying to serve God of Israel, but he was also serving idols. And we, and we are able to get a glimpse of how he's feeling in the book of Ecclesiastes when he says, Vanity, vanity, all is vanity. I've seen, Sid, I've seen everything under the sun, but it's all vanity. You start to see the start of a man who's going downhill. Spiritually, well, he's very pretty much at rock bottom at the moment. Even though there's kind of a depressive and oppressive tone to that. But even he, he still has some words of wisdom at the very end of that. In Ecclesiastes 12, in chap, verse, chapter 12, verses 13 through 14. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing. So God knew of his idol worship. He knew of everything that Solomon was doing wrong. Every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Amen. And just moving into part two of my message. But like Solomon, with our relationship with God, it has to start with a sacrifice. 
starts with the sacrifice. And it always, we're always sacrificing daily. We're supposed to die daily. And we see that neglect, as Pastor Trey was mentioning, about that neglect. Solomon was neglecting his salvation. It was a different time back then. Like, there was a different dispensation. So they, there was no Holy Spirit like that or anything. But he wasn't following the commandments of God. He was having idols. That was even in the, in the commandments. I don't know whether I idol before me, for I, for I am a jealous God, and he's, he's got a bunch of idols, and he's worshiping them. He's built a bunch of groves all over Israel, all the groves, these high places for them to worship their gods. When he started out, as I said, with a thousand sacrifices, he started out so well. Amen. I think that's what we, we need to start getting back to the basics. The basics of Pentecost, the, ba- the basics of this apostolic, the basics of this Bible. We need, to go back, we need to go back to repentance. That's something that's rarely preached now. I don't think it's, I haven't heard many messages on repentance for people to come back to God and to ask God to forgive their sins. But it's not a, two, a two-word thing, you know, God forgive me, boom, I'm done. Well, no, I, I don't think that's how it goes. You've got to get into detail. You've got to get to the nitty-gritty of what... When, what, of what you have wrong in your life. And we don't need to let compromise in either. This world is full of idols. We see them every day. It can be your car. It could be your home. It could be anything now. You've got vaping. You've got marijuana. You've got smoking. You've got all these different types of addictions that are out there now. And there's more than there's ever been in this world. Like, it's crazy what's happened over in the past, like, 30-odd years. Once computers came out, everything just kind of escalated watching things on the internet, watching, doing things like that that they're not supposed to. But, that, but we allow those compromises in. We allow those strange idols into our life. Those strange things that they seek to, to compromise. Because once you compromise a little bit, why don't you compromise a little bit more? I'm not encouraging you in any way at all. But you can see how compromise, it's, it's, it starts to, it just grows. The Bible even says in Song of Solomon, the little foxes are what spoils the vine. That's what spoils our walk with God. It spoils it. It takes it away. It makes it seem kind of stagnant, kind of stale. Hallelujah. Amen. But what's wrong is always is still wrong. What won't enter heaven still won't enter heaven. What will enter heaven is what will enter heaven. I mean, the Bible tells us so. Hallelujah. If we could stand right now. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I want us all to come up to this altar today. Amen. I mean, Solomon, he offered a thousand sacrifices, burnt offerings. You know how long that would have taken? How long it would have taken to light each and every one of those on fire to go and gather the wood? To put it on, to build that up? We need to go back for some old-fashioned repentance. We need to just wash ourselves clean, get a good scrubbing in. Get a thousand offerings worth. Just, just got to scrub ourselves. And just become clean. And don't let compromise in that God would put a hedge of protection around each and every one of us. That we'd be mindful of the things that go on because there are things every, each and every day that try and grab us. Every single day there's always something that's trying to take you away, to take your mind someplace else. To distract you, to make you feel defeated. Just to make you feel down or just to mess with you. We need to stand on the promises of God and we need to go back to the basics. Hallelujah, Jesus. If, you could, if the music would play and if we could come up to this altar now.